You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome, Welcome to, to episode... episode 53 of a Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living our life in ruins. I took over for Carlton. Carlton? Thank you, David. Um, we're going to investigate the careers of those living life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I am joined by my co-hosts, uh, David Ian Howe and Connor John. And, uh, today, in uh, Just the Boys episode, we are going to be tackling the pre-Clovis and Clovis debate or explanations for the initial occupation of the Americas by homo sapiens sapiens. Um, So we have a list of emphasis on homo sapiens sapiens, by the way. Yes. (laughs) Emphasis, emphasis, nothing, nothing else. No, no settlers of Cerruti here. Uh, (laughs) Are you guys finally agreeing on it's homo sapiens sapiens? Cause you guys were, there was beef. It's always been Homo sapiens sapiens, but the debate was, is it Homo sapiens neanderthalensis or Homo neanderthalensis? Oh, okay, okay, and we okay. all know if you are a Homo <laughs> sapiens sapien with a fully functioning evolved brain, you know it is Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Uh, only uh, someone with Neanderthal DNA would call it Homo neanderthalensis and not Homo sapiens. 2.2 percent you. <laughs> Point proven. Human. Point proven. <laughs> So <laughs> we're not, we're not gonna talk about Paleo at the this episode. Yeah, we're yeah, moving aside from that. <laughs> um so really we're gonna talk about pre Clovis and Clovis here in the North American and I guess South American too, archaeological record. Um the the three of us all got our masters at uh University of Wyoming, a rather prolific Paleo Indian uh department, hunter gatherer department, I would say. Wouldn't wouldn't you guys agree? very much so very very heavy in that um you know we have some of the the big players in the game you know todd cerebello bob kelly who are you know interested in this time period and there's also a a, a, like a ton of archaeology sites paleo indian sites in wyoming that are actually studied at the university of wyoming so it's we were exposed to this stuff very early on in our graduate career and it's kind of i don't know if it's shaped your guys's view on this stuff but it certainly brought to light a bunch of issues. Yeah, and don't forget the late great George Frizen, as well as uh, you know Doctor Doctor Cornfell and Doctor Doctor Larson, who do the Hell Gap, which has that is like a Cody complex, right? Do they have a Clovis component? I know I work there, but I know it goes deep. I just don't know how deep. I don't think it. There's a Clovis point from Hell Gap, right? Uh, it's Paleo Indian. I don't know. If Definitely, it's Clovis, but oh. hang on, guys. It's um. Hello. Oh, what's up, National Geographic? Oh, it's Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. I, you see, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Thank you, National Geographic, for calling me and telling me this in the middle of a podcast. I love you too. Bye. I was about to get so mad. <laughs> Sack of shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for that, David. Thank um, National I, Geographic. <laughs> yep, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that was them. Um, excellent. So this whole, God darn you, David, um, (laughs) this whole topic about man's antiquity in the United States stems from, um, the enlightenment period, right? Uh, and particularly in the 1800s, there were some, Projectile points found in like it was like a French river, right? With some Pleistocene animals. A French river? Yeah. So the whole like conversation about the antiquity of man globally. Oh, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's like uh I forget what what river it was in France, but this whole debate got kicked off by them finding a bunch of projectile points in extinct megafauna from Europe. And for a long time, they hadn't the question of how long man has been in the Americas was um, pondered because they hadn't found anything like that. Um, But that all changed, didn't it boys? Yeah, it did. One could say. (laughs) So uh, the important site in this is the, the Folsom site in Folsom, New Mexico, 
which I hear is not the greatest town, but it's worth visiting at some point um, if you're down there. Um, and it was also discovered. I'm, I'm not completely clear. Um, it was also completely clear exactly how it went, but uh, George McJunkins, who was a, um, a fr- he was a freed slave, right? Was eventually one of the, the first founders of uh, what we know as like the first Folsom point in, embedded in uh, a Pleistocene megafauna. So it's, it's, it's kind of a cool story and it really, you know, it, he, he did some important stuff um, for the field, but I think that's, that's, that's all I got on it. Any, any other details that I'm missing? Was there someone before him that found uh projectile points with a mammoth that confirmed the antiquity first? And then he was the first one to say that they, they lived with, no, because that's right. George McJohn was the one that confirmed that people were here during the Ice Age. Yeah. Maybe I yeah. am thinking of the French thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So McJunkin was a freedman, um, cowboy, working working property outside of Folsom, New Mexico. And out of an eroding arroyo, uh, he noticed that there were some bones that looked a little way too big to be uh, cow bones. So we checked them out. Turned out to be an extinct species of um, Pleistocene bison. And uh, he contacted archaeologists from, I think, from Denver, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, I believe, because yeah. that Folsom Point is at the History Colorado, the State Historic Museum. And they came down, and there's that really famous photograph of a Folsom Point uh, in in C two in between these two bison ribs, and that was like, okay, there's the evidence that man's been here. Um, and then later on, outside of Clovis, New Mexico. Um, that's where they found the Clovis point and which was older, older than Folsom. And just, uh, just to give so, it a time period. So this is like, this is in 1908 when they, when he first discovers this. So early, early tw- 20th century. I can't do math. Yeah. nineteen yeah, like before world war one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like super early on in archeology span and we as a discipline in America, I don't even think we were a discipline in reality. Very much antiqui- antiquarian still. Yeah. So not a professional field quite yet, right? Yeah. We had like history and I believe we had like archaeology, but it was like you went to Greece and Rome and did all that crap, you know, and you were at Harvard and you were like, <laughs> yeah. And like, that's what archaeology was until then. Then like, you know, literally found by a cowboy. And then the rest of the time it was like, let's go pitch a tent in the middle of the woods and just dig some holes in the ground and find some rocks. And then that's kind of what we're doing now. Change the game. Yeah, 100%. Totally changed the game. And with that, um, Blackwater Draw, New Mexico, is somewhere in there as well. It is a place. It is. I don't know. It's like, it's is. basically the Texas border. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's. That's the actual site it was at. It's it's outside of Folsom, New Mexico, and the locality is called. Oh, Blackwater Draw. that might be. A- yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, yeah. We might if we get hate mail, so be it. But um, stuff and is- Clovis <laughs> is about like thirteen thousand years ago. That's how. That's the time frame for Clovis. Uh, like thirteen five, thirteen two, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's constantly being like changed and and modified challenge and yeah, challenge some article that was like clovis was only around for 250 years like i don't know about that yeah uh so i got 1300 to 11 sorry 13,000 to 11,000 bp and clovis was found at blackwater that's where clovis was found was blackwater oh, okay Drop. okay gotcha okay gotcha. yeah that makes, so yeah. that makes sense right we know what we're talking about Ex- yeah, exactly we have degrees uh so it, and so there's and, and and from this there stems um this theory this this idea that the the Clovis people were the first people in Americas and they they come into America uh in these this small little time period where um there's an ice free corridor um between the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets Cordillerian. and uh, Cord- Cordillerian and uh in Alaska, that kind of area. So this is the stems and this is kind of the accepted uh, theory 
you know, starting from there on out. Yeah. And, and the big question is like, okay, if there's people here in the ice age, how'd they get here? And that was kind of like the big like debate for a long time. And especially those early sites, Clovis, Folsom, those are all in like New Mexico, right? We're not finding yeah. these early sites early on in the beginning of the 20th century on the West coast, on the East coast. And as Connor was talking about this ice free corridor, cause around, um, let's see, like from the Beringian shoreline, which is the landmass that connected, um, Eastern Siberia with, um, Alaska, uh, you know, that, that was rather substantial. Like it extended, I believe like from the North the current coast of Siberia out upwards of like 400 miles. Um, completely connected. But the problem was for a long time that um, Pleistocene ice sheet before the, and I'm, if I'm on, if you're watching the video, I'm using my hands before the uh, Laurentide and Cordillerian separated. I mean, you're talking about game of Thrones, ice wall height of glaciers. Like they're upwards of a mile high. You're not climbing them. And if you do, there's nothing up there. I should have thrown you from the top of the wall, boy. <laughs> Um, exactly. Do you guys know who first thought about the land bridge theory? Actually, I don't. Jose de Acosta. Um, he was a Franciscan monk or a friar, I think, in uh, New Spain, um, or Spanish missionary. And yeah, he was like looking at a map and everyone was like, you know, how do these people get here? Like where are all these Mayans coming from? Where are these Aztecs coming from? And he looked at the map and he was like, oh, see Alaska and Russia, they're pretty close. You know, I mean, it wasn't Alaska at the time, but like maybe they just, you know, walked or, you know, floated across that little gap there. And that's kind of where it came from. And yeah, say. and, and it, it's possible to cross it. I think there was a recent paper. We should have that person on that showed um, there were Italian glass beads and in Inuit communities in Alaska. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Prior to European colonization in the south because they had traveled along the silk road and got to inuit communities in eastern russia and they were trading them with their relatives across the strait really yeah dude it's nuts it's pretty sick so it's possible we got the evidence that's what we got so yeah this ice free corridor the ice free corridor didn't open up and here's 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 there's a distinction we got to make when does it open up and when is it livable because even after there's no ice there there's nothing else it probably looks like a lot like Hoth, right? There's nothing in there except for some giant grizzly bears hiding yeah. around. Well, and, and, as it, taunt, taunt, not. and as it's melting, there's just water and it's just like this muddy, disgusting mess. Like how do you actually traverse in between two glaciers that are actively melting? So it looks on the sides, it's like Tauntauns. And in the sun, well, I guess in the winter, it's like Hoth and there's Tauntauns and wampas and all that stuff and then you know in the summer when things start to melt it's just disgusting i, I don't know if you've ever been and it's mosquitoes. still cold yeah, yeah. It's just still still just cold and miserable well the it's idea just... though is right that they were following like herd animals and like following bison and horses and mammoth and all that into the corridor so if you're an efficient big game hunter like you were in siberia coming across here if you got a mammoth you got a nice dry you know, hut to build. Um, and you know, can you make skin tents and things like that and, and you can make your way down the corridor and you got plenty of food to eat. But like the question, like you guys are asking is like, you know, how livable is that? Cause you still got to find water. You still got to find, uh, you know, some other stuff to subside on the besides just meat. Um, though they could have, uh, just been eating meat. I don't know. It's a lot to consider. But I mean, it, it just makes sense though, right? You're following herd animals. This corridor opens up. They're looking for the food. They're going to go south. You just follow them. I don't know why people are like, it's just a stupid idea. It's like, no, it's pretty logical. I don't well, know. <laughs> well, and then kind of like future like uh, research has shown that, that uh, the opening occurred right before Clovis people really show up in America. So it's not like... They're just like, oh, of course, it's empty in this point. And then the people should have known there's like actual evidence suggesting that the ice free corridor started to open, uh, melt, uh, you know, right, right before the Clovis folks really show up in America. So it, it's 
and it's hard to argue against that as coincidence in reality. Yeah. And there's yeah. been like pollen analysis because even if it's open, right, you know, as, as Dave was talking about that corridor is several thousand miles long. And in order to follow the big game, they need to eat something, which is a lot of grass. So there's like pollen um, research that's been done, pollen residue, pollen residue, pollen samples. So even though it was open, it took a while for the grasses to resettle to allow the big game animals to eat. But that still happens prior to Clovis populations showing up in the like interior of the U.S., right? Because we're still talking about sites on like the Southwest great plains, really nothing on the West coast. And, and we'll get into this in, in the later segment, the sites that we do have on the East coast, uh, when we're going to, we're going to talk about those such as Meadowcraft, cactus Hill and topper. So I, I mean this, this idea of Clovis people being related to the ice free corridor, I think largely checks out. I mean, you guys would agree. Yeah, it's just the only reason it doesn't check out is because people are looking for every little cherry picked argument to say that it doesn't check out. And like, I'll see people on Reddit or like social media be like, is it the Bering Land Theory outdated and like er, er, incorrect? And it's like, it's not that it's incorrect. It's just that there are also other pathways people could come that wasn't just the corridor. They could have come down in boats too. That doesn't make the other one incorrect, which just tells me that you don't want it to be correct. What? And like, drives me up the wall. <laughs> well, I think, and but I think initially when it's this Clovis first theory is coming out, they're, they're proponents of like, it's only Clovis first and there's nothing else. And then there's this like, um, and this is informal and it, it's what people call it. It's just like Clovis mafia that goes around and kind of promotes it and doesn't really accept anything besides, you know, this kind of theory. But I, I don't, I don't know if that's still today, or I think there's this more of ex- acceptance that there could be possible multiple migrations into Americas, the Americas in reality. We don't prefer Clovis Mafia, or I should say, they don't prefer Clovis Mafia. <laughs> David just Clovis outed himself. <laughs> organized crime family. Um, so, yeah, don't. It's not Mafia. All right. Excellent. And so um, these other hypotheses real quick. And then yeah, David jump on in like these other So we have ice free corridor and the other ones that we're going to talk about in this episode, you have uh Salutrian maritime route or coastal highway, also kelp highway. And there's also this like oceanic one, um, Polynesian in, uh, colonization. And we'll get to those like later in this episode. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, David. Um, I was going to say, if if you're curious to know like what we're talking about and you want to get a picture of it, the best way to describe this is honestly the, the movie ice age, um, the beginning of it, like as the credits roll, all those big herd animals are leaving, uh, presumably Europe going into the Americas or, or vice versa. And like, they're all migrating somewhere because the weather's changing. And then the people in the, the humans in the story are like Pleistocene hunters, which I think are presumed to be indigenous Americans. Um, or Siberians. It's just, you know, the way they look and the tools that they use. But I always thought that was like awesome. And like, it kind of goes off that theory, but those animals that are walking in are definitely North American animals, uh, walking through the corridor. Uh, and I thought that was a really cool touch in the movie. Um, And as, and as animals are walking in, there's animals walking out like horses are peace. Yeah, they're they're from they're from North America, but they go the opposite way into into Europe. So there's there's it you know camels. There's as an well. exchange. There's a highway. Mm-hmm. Camels, antelope, right? Because like pronghorn in the U.S. are related to gazelles in Africa. Pronghorn's closest living relative is the giraffe, actually. Um, well, I was wrong. And on yeah, that note, but, we will be back. <laughs> antelope Capra Day is like their yeah. Anyway, but yeah, that's why they got those little things on their head. Like giraffes have those little like antenna looking things. It's just a giant long neck pronghorn. I'll never done. unsee that. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, we'll be right back with our conversation about Clovis and pre Clovis uh, here in, in segment two of episode 53. Welcome back to episode 53 of Life and Ruins podcast. We are here chatting about pre Clovis, Clovis. Uh, Clovis organized syndicates, uh, as you will, as you will see. Uh, so we, we kind of introduced allegedly. the allegedly, allegedly, they're nothing proven. Um, 
we talked about these two other theories, uh, at least mentioned them in the previous segment, the, the Solutrean hypothesis, uh, the maritime hypothesis, and then also the um, uh, Polynesian kind of hypothesis. So after Clovis is discovered and it's really not proven, there's not a lot of pre-Clovis stuff that really is proven after those discoveries. And then you kind of get these series of sites that are discovered that have dates that might push the boundaries of, of Clovis stuff. And on the, on the Salutrian side, kind of this East coast um, idea you have, you know, Meadowcroft, Topper, Galt, Cactus Hill, and the theory behind all these like kind of paleo Indian, this, the Salutrian hypothesis is that these points projectile points in, in France really match or are similarly napped to what is discovered at Meadowcroft, yeah, would... Topper, and things like that. Yeah, but those points. So that's that's. I wouldn't say thing. match for sure. Let's, yeah. let's, let's yeah. that out of here. Yeah, let's yeah, let's let's put an asterisk on that one. Yeah, like you know the 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 Clovis sites are known as Clovis sites because you find Clovis points and a lot of times butchered animals, flakes, and you find people start finding what they call pre Clovis. But there's no diagnostic points. There's no really butchered animals. They just look like shatter, which we we talk about in the um, Sruti episode. And then you start getting sites like Meadowcroft, Cactus Hill, and Topper. And I think those are like 60s, 70s. Those are being excavated. And this ties into what Connor talked about, Salutrian, which is really promoted by Dennis Stanford, who got his master's at the University of Wyoming. Uh, Bruce Bradley. I don't know where he got his degrees from. Um, somewhere else that was like legit, like a, a prestigious place. Um, yeah. He's a cool and, guy. I like him a yeah. lot. And um, yeah, they're nice people. Well, and you know, rest in peace, Dennis Stanford. They work for the Smithsonian. And they have this idea that Salutrian points and Clovis are really similar. But if you actually look at a Clovis point, which is fluted and has those little like like earlobes at the bottom ears ears. Yeah. They got ears on them and they're fluted, but you look at a, a Salutrian point, not only are they from a like completely different part of Europe, not really f- Northern France there. There's like a separation in time, like Salutrian points, like what, like 20,000 years, 30,000 years. You don't get Clovis until like 12,000 years ago in the Americas. They're not fluted. They don't have those ears. They don't look really similar. And the Salutrian points appear to be like really decorative. So there uh, really isn't a match. Salutrian, if you're if you the audience listening, if you want a good example of that, the movie Alpha, that's Salutrian culture. Um yeah. They make Salutrian points there. And well and they, they so good. and there's also this thing where um the Salutrian technology that they find in Europe disappears around like seventeen thousand years ago. It really just kind of goes away. So it's so it's a little circumstantial <laughs> and how they're right. it's, approaching it. It's kind of like, um, like what Cumberland is to Clovis, you know, like it's, it's like a regionally distinct area. Cause it, uh, what do you call it? Salutrian's just a form of Gravedian. It's like a, like the bigger Gravedian cultural complex of Europe at that time. And then Salutrian are like the people that distinctly lived in France and made those points that way. Um, but like, Yes, it just kind of fades out of, you know, popularity or whatever. And like the theory being that they like got up and left and they kind of skirted uh, along the uh, the ice sheets and hunted some in, in the Atlantic, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. not mammoth, allegedly, so not allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they hunted, uh, you know, uh, sea mammals and kind of skirted along this allegedly allegedly they floated on the ice sheet across from france to delaware by hunting seals and laying on the ice sheet at night making a camp out of their boats turned upside down with oil fires on the inside love the idea the execution is much to be desired guys like let me see you do it and then we'll talk about droves of people leaving France 
coming to Delaware to use some Old Bay on their mammoths. <laughs> old Bay all day, baby. I, <laughs> I love Old Bay. Come at me, guys. Like, I, it's just, it's an absurd idea, Bruce. And like, I love the idea of comparing the technologies, right? Like you got those those barbed points you find in Japan that also correlate with the ones that are in the Channel Islands in California, which might support the Kelp Highway hypothesis. But you know, that one makes a little more sense. Yeah, there's Just some throw coast. That out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there, yeah there's, exactly. There's some there's coast. Like, there's land. <laughs> this one is like they're purely surviving on ice, and it's like, all right, okay. But like you get sites like Meadowcroft, and I'm I'm familiar with Meadowcroft. It was excavated by um Adavazio, Dr. Adavazio. At the time, he was working out at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and the guy that got me into archaeology, Dr. David Clark, who's a professor in anthropology at Catholic, um, he was his grad student. He'd, apparently, the story is like Adavazio just busted in the lab and was like, got a site, let's go dig it. And that's how David Clark got involved. And he brought us out to Meadowcroft. And there's a couple things about Meadowcroft, fellas. It's never been published. So this was done like in the 70s. Audio, he's just never published on it. He's sitting on that material. It's in coal country. <laughs> it's in, you know, it's in Pennsylvania. So like they're dating charcoal. That's interesting. The, the, but the thing with Meadowcroft is if you look at it, the way that the the rock has collapsed, it, it does kind of, it, it'd be really hard to get charcoal you know it's it looks like tetris almost to get that level yeah. but he's never published on every time they redate the material it gets younger and younger so we really can't talk much about metal crop and once again there's no nothing diagnostic the diagnostic so there aren't points there's just some interesting looking shatter which could be naturally formed right but metal yeah. crop i think now stands they claim nineteen thousand years ago so seventeen hundred or seventeen thousand uh BCE. Um they have a really gorgeous interpretive center though. Like you go to their website. The they site histor- is really cool. Yeah, yeah, they have a historic village, they have outlatal days, like it's like they have a woodland village up there. It's like really cool to visit, to be honest. And they also have some like frontier day stuff like 1770s. Like it's a really cool like the rock like, shelter itself is cool. Like it, it's a cool looking place. Yeah. Never been. I've just seen a virtual tour online, and they they do have a really good virtual tour. If you just Google Metacroft Rock Shelter, it, that's a cool looking thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that that was like, like really it gets like, brought into that whole Salutrian argument. Yeah, and that was I think that was one of the first ones to really to be discovered and kind of grouped in there, from what I kind of generally remember. Um, but then there's other sites like um, you know David's pretty familiar with Topper. Um, which is it's I am you you've been there I've been there dug a few holes there drank some swamp water some swamp water yeah some um, swamp water had some great times there my formative years of archaeology hanging out made me fall in love with archaeology is there 50,000 year old uh flakes down there in the Pleistocene terrace who's to say uh is there an overwhelming amount of Clovis artifacts on the Clovis level at 13,000 to 11,000 years old, uh, scattering the entire site in its entirety. I can say, yes, there are. Have I personally stuck an auger down the middle of a, uh, the bottom of the Clovis fuller down another meter and pulled something out and not found anything in it. I can say there's nothing in it, but in this one spot, where there's this giant pit excavation. It's a beautiful looking excavation with a big like built, you know, like ceiling on it and everything kind of like hell gap has. Um, they think that there are 50,000 year old, uh, Ben breaks down in there. Um, and a dissertation came out and proved that it's probably just, you know, ice can shatter things just as easily in half like that. Um, 50,000 no, years ago? 50,000 years ago. And to put that into perspective, people only got to Australia 40,000 years ago. So they would have had to have booked it from, from all the way to us, like bypass that, gone all the way up through Siberia or wherever, you know, down the coast or whatever, all the way to the Georgia South Carolina border. Um, I don't think that's the thing. Hey, if you're and on like a, the rest of the site, uh huh. If you're on a mission, man, come on. I could, I could if you're down. on a mission, but you would have had to have, like, you know, been walking through, you know, like Iran 
and been like, you know what? Really, really want to book it to Allendale, South Carolina. Let's just go. And like made it the whole way, made boats, a strategic plan, rolled down the map, blitzkrieged it to South Carolina. Really, guys? I don't think so. Allegedly. It's about the old bay. They they created old <laughs> they bay. Want the, they want, they want the old bay. They want, they want those blue crabs, man. They were there for a blue crab bake. Um <laughs> I, I love Al. He's a great man. Al Goodyear. But he he's the one who runs Topper. Um he's retired now. Topper's kind of retired itself. But I <clears throat> I don't think sorry, I coughed, Chris. Um here we go. I don't think that it is a 50,000 year old site. Um, I think 13 to 11 and I think 11 is the date we usually get. It's 11 or 10. I can't recall, but I've personally picked out a Clovis point there myself. It was broken in half and it was fluted. And I can tell that that person who did that was like, <laughs> and threw it. Um, but yeah, the, the rest of it there, I don't, it was, Dean. I don't think so. Well, it was Dean. And guys, I, if you're listening, uh, go back to that one episode where we talk about Dean. It's just Ralph Wiggum and the archaeological record. But also, <laughs> I don't mean to say that like I'm claiming authority that like I know what's best for this site. Like I've literally, like I'm saying, put an auger through. <laughs> I think two units I did, or I did one myself. Saw another one go through, all the way down to the bottom, past the Clovis level, and every ten inches down or however a bucket of an auger is is like what ten, twelve inches. I think it's ten inches. Um. 10 centimeters. There you go. Uh, nothing. Nothing. In it. I remember being like void. <laughs> and then we just like wrote on the map. Like, nothing down there. Uh, the rest of it could maybe from the river because it is on the river that, you know, rivers are known to flood uh, and move stuff around. But anyway, that's my soapbox on that. Let's move on to uh, Cactus Hill. I know nothing about it. I don't know much about it either. I think Crabo worked there. He worked at Paisley Caves. I know that, but I think he did do something at Cactus Hill, though. Mm. or knows about it maybe all right let's give cactus hill let's go to Paige ladson well they're but like kind of connected with that is that like you guys know about the like the chesapeake mastodon that's the one that was the salutrian thing right yeah that's the yeah. one where they dredged a mastodon out of the chesapeake looking for blue crabs i imagine to put old bane <laughs> on oh. and uh pulled out like a mastodon skull and there was like an, an undiagnostic knife found with it and then they dated the Mastodon was like 22,000 years. And there's like this geologist hit up Stanford and like, oh, look, yes, it matches with Meadowcroft, Cactus Hill and Topper. Um, you know, this this proves it. And it's like, nah, fam, I don't like I don't know much about like underwater archaeology, but like. Or that whole process. But it's at the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay, and I don't know how close that knife was found in C2. When you're sucking it in a dredge machine. Like a, you're literally pulling out of a vacuum and then shooting it into like a bin, like pumping stuff from the ground in, through a tube into a bin to collect it and sift the water out. There's no context. Yeah. I wonder what the the carbon nitrogen ratios are, right? Like the isotope ratios, because if it's been under underwater for so long, there has to be some funny business going on with the isotopes. So I'd be like really curious to see if they redated it today, if it would pass under modern like chronometric standards. That's above my pay grade. I don't know. Yeah, Same. If anyone who does that, let it, let us know. And for all those who also uh, very much enjoy Old Bay, please uh, send us a review. Spons- <laughs> Welcome to <Sponsored by laughs> Old Bay. Podcast. Brought to you by Old Bay. Um, I think, and, and kind of going on with this underwater archaeology thing, uh, Paige Ladson is kind of, is an underwater archaeology site, which has dates to... What do they have? Is it? Oh my gosh! Fourteen. Where 14, is it? Five. It's in. It's it's in Florida, right off of Florida. Florida. It's in a yeah. It's in a sinkhole in some river uh, in the Big Bend region, wherever that is. So, and I I think we, I would love to have uh, Jesse Halligan on the show to to talk about this. I know her and Shane are really good friends, and I I think. You know, because this is this is being studied right now, and this might be something that kind of bears fruit eventually. I mean, it seems like their dates are are solid, um, and how it fits into everything. Uh, so I think we can. I don't think we can write off Paige Ladson 
right now because it's still actively being studied and we'll see what what happens. But I think the bigger problem with this Solutrean hypothesis is really what people are using it to say. It's like what is what is what ultimately coming out of this uh, the solution hypothesis is this idea that Europeans were the first people to colonize America. And there are some racial connotations and issues with uh, current uh, Native Americans and things like that, that people have really taken to another, almost in, into like a white supremacy kind of thing that Europeans are the only people, you know, we're here in America first. So all native um, first people folk, here. Yeah. Yeah. And Allegedly. And here's the thing though, people 20,000 years ago in Europe, they weren't white. They weren't white at all. So theory, theory ousted next. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was that simple though, yeah. but it, I wish it was that simple though, you know, it's, but it's, it's just, it's taken. So it's like this great idea, like, okay, maybe there's this connection between Europe and America and maybe people came here early, but it's just taken this whole racial connotation thing that I don't know, Carlton, how do you, I assume that what, what, that wasn't his intent, right? Yeah. Like, you know, that's not what like Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley aren't saying here. Like, you know, white power, like we got here from France. Like that's not, they're, they're just trying to look at human migrations. They're not talking about race or skin color. And like, as David said, there's people living in, is this Mesolithic Europe? Uh, Paleolithic still. Paleolithic 20,000 years ago. They're not white. We haven't had the, you know, Indo thing happen yet. That expansion. So go ahead. Let them chant. Europeans got to America first. But show them what the picture, get a Tori Mazda to draw it up. <laughs> show them what people look like then. They'll be like, what? Oh, natives got here first. <laughs> we should have, we should have a Tori drop a piece of them entering the Chesapeake. The, these like brown Europeans with Salutrian points and Old Bay seasoning in their other hand, like at the shore. <laughs> That's the episode of Blackard. Pra- praying to a blue, blue crab. But like, you know, as the, the dangerous thing about it is if you go, I, I don't suggest you go to this site, take it from me. The official White Pride Worldwide website says. Link in the bio. <laughs> no, no links. <laughs> really link, link, link in the show notes. Go, go there. <laughs> You'll be on a watch list. It says move over First Nations. You have it wrong. The very le- latest DNA research has now proven conclusively that DNA lineage probably found in Europe got to the Great Lakes at least 15,000 years ago and possibly earlier, several thousand years before Indians made across the Bering Strait. Whites were the first Americans after all, and they talk about Salutrian. However, none of that DNA research that they talk about is valid, and the Salutrian, of course, is highly problematic. And even if it was, they're not white. Control F for Jews on that site. Let me see what they got to say about me. And on that David, note, we're uh, going to segment. We're not going to do that. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll catch you in segment three where we're talking episode 53, pre-Clovis, Clovis, and we'll catch you in the next segment. I am loving this. <laughs> this is fun. Welcome back to episode 53 of a Life Remembrance podcast. This is segment three. We are talking about Clovis, pre-Clovis, everything surrounding that. Uh, You've been hearing some top-tier journalism, if you don't mind me saying myself. Um, Yeah, so let's get on to, um, you know, the rest. Absolutely. So, Salutrine outright, you guys can take this to the bank and cash this in. We'll 100% support you. Salutrine is not, not legit. There's no DNA evidence that supports it. The material evidence doesn't support it. The sites themselves are Mickey Mouse Clubhouse kind of stuff. They're fun to read, but uh, that's about it. And uh, you can email me if you disagree, and uh, I don't care. But, <laughs> however, continuing on this, like, Clovis is established. We know Clovis is established. We have the material remains. And there are still people looking for, like, Pre Clovis, you have like the Galt site and Deborah Friedkin out in Texas. Once again, no diagnostic materials. It's just a bunch of wonky looking flakes. Is it legit? Probably not. Now, is a organization that excavated them the like first Americans organization? I think they are. Like their whole goal is to find the earliest stuff. Center for the study of the first Americans. Yeah, 
Texas are, they, are they are they biased? Maybe I don't know. I don't know those people. If you do, reach out. We'd love to have you on the show. Um, I know some A and M people. They're good people. Really? Yeah, I bet a lot. I like all archaeologists. Some just I just don't agree with professionally. Uh, others I would uh, I don't agree with ethically or morally. But that's a different day. Uh, did I tell you guys when I went out to A and M to visit for my PhD? They were like, well, "You're from Wyoming," and I was like, "Yeah." They were like. I thought there was like this beef between Wyoming and A&M. And I was like, I, I didn't know there was beef. And they're like, oh, there's definitely beef. You're the first Wyoming person to be here. And I was like, looked around and I was like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> there was, a, I, 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 this, this is relevant. The first winter I was back from Wyoming, back in Northern Virginia, I was on Tinder, as one does. When you're uh, <laughs> outside of Laramie and you actually have a Tinder pool above five. And I matched with one of Ian Hodder's graduate students. Oh. Yeah. And we were messaging back and forth. Like, yeah, we're both archaeologists. She's like, yeah, my advisor is Ian Hodder. And I was like, oh, well, my advisor is Bob Kelly. She's like, like Robert Kelly from like the University of Wyoming. I was like, yeah. She's like, oh. She reported you? Yeah, I'm busy. And then like <laughs> just cut the match. And I, I texted Crave. I was like, you want to get this, man? Um, yeah. So I, <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, – Oh boy! But oh my God. so okay, so Monteverde so, Chile, yeah, Monteverde, which is, I think, one of the more interesting like pre Clovis sites. It, nah. it's, oh, piss off! The the okay, so it's you know, it's a it's a solid like stratigraphic site that has dates. Um, I, I'm not sure what the uh, the initial the the uh, highest level dates are, but it goes from back to apparently 33,000 years before present. Uh, I think it's, it's, it, and it's, yeah, it's in Chile. It's in the, you know, the bottom of uh, South America. So it's, it, it's kind of this interesting site in that it appears to be very old and is also very far from where we know humans originally came from. And this isn't allegedly, you know, from from Asia um, down into the Americas. So I don't know. I think I think and we can talk about. But this the thirty three thousand year stuff isn't diagnostic. Yeah, but like the diagnostic stuff, the wooden tent pegs, the Macedon hide, the stone tools, which are which are diagnostic, the El Yobo projectile points. Those all come from a around fourteen thousand eight hundred year old occupation like that's the one that people stick with not the thirty three thousand year one and that's well dated are they actually tent stakes though think about it though because you have you have post whatever they are you have all these old pre-clovis and clovis sites where there's no organics no organics ever found and it's just like chipstone points and like some shatter and then this place is like we got seaweed and we have tent stakes and old bay, <laughs> and, and, yeah, <laughs> and, and, old um, bay. and like i i don't know about that man i think the site it's cool right and they got that little medicine bundle but like is it a medicine bundle who's to say carl's not be able to say i didn't know there was a medicine bundle but no uh, the mastodon hide though the process mastodon hide the, I, i'll take tent pegs because even clovis sites have you know Most, um yeah. radiocarbon dated um post holes I think I I think it's legit. I and that whole thing goes with that that kelp highway coastal migration and the reason why we don't find sites even in between like the sea the sea levels rose 120 meters at the end of the Pleistocene. So all the early sites even on the east west coast you know they're underwater now, but this Monteverde site is up is it, I don't think it's a cave, but it's in higher elevation. Yeah, it's it's like um it's inland. It's not on the coast, but it's yeah. like closer to the coast than like, you know yeah. Topper is. It's on a. It's but on a bay. This was like the first you know? possibly confirmed pre Clovis. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this one had day. diagnostics. Yeah, there's there's stone tools in that and in that seaweed and stuff like that and cordage as well. So I, it's not just seaweed and you know post post holes or whatever. You know, so there's a, there's a little bit more Tin containers with red tops. 
get out of here. Dude, the old bag tin can is like, <laughs> like I'm just saying. I it's can't iconic. believe this is like, oh, no. if you're, I, if, this is the old bag episode you're from of the like, Atlantic, <laughs> you know about old bag. <laughs> I know old bag, dude. Um, I think it's a cool idea. And I think, yes, the kelp highway hypothesis, which we should talk about here, it does lead me to believe that that is a possibility. But I just know there's a lot of criticism to it that's like valid. And there's also criticism that's like against that criticism that like is also valid. So I don't personally know. It's just such a one off site all the way down there that's like has these organics, but like, do they? I don't yeah. know. But the El Yobo point at Monte Verde looks awfully similar to the bone projectile point found in the Manus Mastodon kill in, um, what is it? Washington state. And that's 13,800 years ago, also along the West coast. And it's all these, that same projectile point typology is being found all across early sites that are all dating to around 14,000 and above 13,5. How you spell along the West coast, uh, J O B O. And they're all found on the West coast and they're all diagnostic. Now that people are looking there, like that pool of people that are pre Clovis is getting much larger. Like I think the last debates that were in Albuquerque, I think I'm pretty sure Bob Kelly was present. I didn't see it, but I know the pool of Clovis first is getting smaller, much smaller. Yeah. Yeah. But then then, not at Wyoming though. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, and the, and the, the El Yobo points are kind of like generally like grouped into this like Western stem, right? Which is supposed to be like this early non-Clovis uh, projectile point uh, technology that occurs along the coast at Harper's Ferry. I think I, I, I could be wrong, but some of the Channel Island stuff, I think, has similar sort of projectile points. Yep. So, so there's like this you know, and I think the dating is obviously the problem, but there's, there is a a stone tool technology that's a little bit different that occurs in kind of this Oregon, Washington, California area, Nevada, maybe too, Alaska Alaska as well. That looks a little different. David's rolling his eyes, but you know, I think uh, like based on, I lean towards Monteverde being real. Um, but I am not fully convinced if that makes sense. Like I'm, I'm open to it. I just like I I'd have to hold the tent stakes in my hand and be like, okay, these are tent stakes. You know, like I don't I don't know. It just seems you think odd to be me. In it. But You'd like, in it is a cool sight. Would that be an intense experience? <laughs> Carlton really liked that one. I love I All love right. that joke. Moving on, camping's intense. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, uh, we got to talk about the kelp highway. So the kelp highway hypothesis by John Erlinson, uh, 2007, I believe is the year. Uh, I could be wrong there. 2005, 2007. And, um, this is the idea that instead of coming through the corridor, maybe they did come through the corridor as well later, that people were coming down through boats along the coast. Um, and if you do the paleoecology, there is, um, an extended kelp forest, that literally reaches from northern Japan all the way up through the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, going up through there to the Aleutian Islands, which is that big, like, you know, island chain south of Alaska, and then all the way down the Pacific towards mid Mexico. You have um, kelp, a kelp forest. Um, so, this would have been the similar environment for people to eat the same foods. The same animals are going to live there, just, you know, varying in climates. Uh, so, mostly seals, fish, kelp. Um, Got all your nutrients. Uh, and there's also similar points. It's not confirmed, but they look very similar in Japan, and they look very similar in Ch- Channel Islands in California. Now, do they look similar because they were the same people? Probably not. But they have a similar function, probably something to do with hunting seals. Um, and you want something that's barbed to keep a hold of the seal when you're pulling it. You know, So I think that's a valid... We can't say it's not valid, you know, because like people clearly were probably coming in boats, but yeah, the boats people are do, all that's how people flooded. got to Australia, right? Like, yeah, we're not talking about like Polynesian, the huge rafts, boat, like the like the vessels they had. Like, you can easily have a small a small boat, and you can follow the coast. Like, unlike Salutrian, where you're following ice, 
mm-hmm. the coast still exists. Like those ice sheets are not covering the West coast completely. Um, they have, they allow for a little pocket of um, land that you can travel. But they, but the big thing is, if you look at the distribution of the glaciers in North America and the, and the mountain ranges, there's like a separation between where the people on the coast could go. And like, if you're, as David said, on the kelp highway, you have, it's highly diverse in uh, food materials. Like you can have a very caloric dense diet, like even up to historic times, uh, Tlingit, Inuit people on the West coast, like they could fish all day and be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, They didn't have to farm. Like you don't, why would you leave that? And it also explains how you could get from, you know, like Manus to Monte Verde really quickly. Cause you could just follow the coast and just camp every night on the shore, you know? So it, it makes sense from like logistically, right? Like in terms of you, this is possible. Yeah. I think I, I, think, I like it. I think that's my favorite. Yeah. You go Connor. Sorry. No, I was just saying, I think that's, and I think as as we go further in archaeology, as we research more on the coast, I think we're going to find more sites that are going to be underwater, maybe that are going to date to this period and and possibly you know confirm this stuff because it's it's just yeah, like you said, it's it's the most legit. And we had um, I think David was there at the University of Wyoming. We had John Erlinson come talk and kind of give his outline for it. And I would you know, and even Todd Suravel, who's pretty much you know, the Clovis organized crime syndicate. I don't think he's the the top boss, but he's, you know, allegedly, allegedly, (laughs) sorry. Allegedly. He's a Don. He's a Don. (laughs) Yeah. No, he's just, he's allegedly a Don. (laughs) No, I think, yeah, he invited just the fucking milk lawyer, paper boy, whatever they call him. (laughs) I'm in waste management. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Yeah, no, I think, but I, I think even Todd, you know, I think it's an it's a it's a super compelling argument. I don't think Todd was convinced ultimately, but it's 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 a really solid argument and very possible. Yeah, and I don't think there has to be like one migration, right? You're probably right, we're talking, that's, probably talking about multiples. I don't that's think the there's pre Clovis east of the Rockies. Like fundamentally, I think Clovis people came through the Ice Free Corridor, and I think there is a a component that's along the coast that just happens to arrive there quicker. And they're probably coming from two different people. You're talking about, if you look at the map of Siberia, people going through the ice free corridor coming from Northern Siberia where, and the people coming from the maritime route, they're along the coast of China, like as David said, Japan and, and the, and the East China sea. So they're probably two groups of people coming in different ways. You have the fishermen and then you have um, uh, primarily terrestrial hunters. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, it's what it is. And like my, my big piece that I always tell people when they ask me on ethno and stuff is like, do you think Clovis first? And I'm like, well, I am Clovis first in the sense that, uh, I am in an organized crime syndicate. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, I'm Clovis <laughs> first in the sense that Clovis is the first widespread ubiquitous culture across the continent. No doubt. 100%. They use the same tools. They make their tools the same way. They live the same way, migrate the same way, and hunt food the same way. However, that does not mean that there weren't a few people coming in boats a couple hundred to maybe a thousand, maybe thousands of years before. But that doesn't mean, and I want to I say this again, that wasn't in droves. That was like a few, few small people. Like what they were saying, we're coming across uh, the the ice corridor or the uh, the ice sheets from uh, it, uh, uh, France. No, I think it's way more likely that small people were coming, not little people, but like, sure people. <laughs> like little statured people, like little amounts of people were coming they through. They were little people. <laughs> yeah, we're coming down the coast. Um, and e- and, and even the Clovis happening. people, right? We're not talking about thousands. Like even population estimates for Clovis are in the hundreds and lower thousands. Right. You know, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of people coming here. The people that colonized North and South America, you're talking about like a, a few thousand So even if it was like a couple dozen on the West coast or maybe, maybe a couple hundred, you know, there's reasons why when there is huge court cases on human remains, like Kennewick man or the ancient one, they show relationships to the Ainu and the West and the West coast. And if you look at West coast peoples, they have higher genetic affinity to um, East Asian populations. And some of the other ones have more Siberian. 
Would you look at that? Yeah, exactly. Right. Would you look at that? <laughs> That's crazy. You know, people aren't throughout time and space across the globe. You know, people are people. They begat with other people. And you you have mixed ancestry regardless, but there's no European or and there's no there's you know there's definitely no Indo European um, coming in. All the genetics points to Siberian or East Asian, so Salutrian's out. And I think like we didn't even touch about it, but a tiny little smidgen, maybe a couple people got lost on their way out of Australia, ended up in South America. Did not like a colonization effect, but maybe got lost. There's a little bit. I'd highly recommend you guys looking that out because it's really minute. It's a new um, paper that came out too. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. that's always been pushed around and they got to Easter Island. They also could have gotten a little further to, uh, you know, the coast. And I think there is some evidence of like chicken bones being somewhere, but I think that's been disproven, uh, in South America. I can't remember. Um, but it's going to be a small, it's going to be a small amount fam for me. Yeah. It's, it's like going to be a small not, amount dog. They're not like, there's not armadas coming across. Mm-hmm. Right. The Kelp Highway or or from Polynesia. It's just like I just don't think humans were organized in that way or we're doing that stuff. Go well. with the genetic flow. And the genetic flow points to East Asian, Northern Siberian peoples. And would you look at that? Don't indigenous Americans and Siberian peoples look pretty similar? Whoa. Especially Inuit people. Like I mean they're they're the closest to those Asian populations. Like you look, like you said, they're trading with each other. <laughs> they're trading, like it's trading lots of so, things, and, it, and they're yeah. But I think and on- if you look at their oral traditions, right? Like something, something that I like, I find fascinating, like Pawnees. We don't in Rickeras and Wichita's. We don't have like a coastal migration route. We have essentially an ice free corridor situation. Talking about mountains of ice and and this land of dark. Whereas other tribes do talk about a coastal. They can't. They followed the coast. So. Ask the tribes. They have oral traditions about these things. And that, you know. So I think I think I don't know. Yeah, Food I think it's a good place, good place to end it. That, you know, the yeah, that's that's where we're at. You know, coasts. It's definitely West Coast. East Coast is out categorically. Yeah, no East Coast. There is no organized crime syndicate to be heard of. You don't know anything about it. It's the first but if you're or- curious, please contact Robert L. <laughs> Kelly at the University of Wyoming. <laughs> Allegedly. I I played the fifth. We are in debitage waste management. <laughs> the first exactly. rule of the exactly. Clovis Mafia is so- that you don't talk about the Clovis Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk about it. You just don't talk about it. So, um... Yeah, you know, we're, we're really excited. We've got some pretty good feedback about the, these Just the Boys topics. We plan on talking more topics like this, uh, covering different archaeological components where it's just us and our goofiness. Um, David, uh, Chris, oh, cut it uh, out right here. Oh, do you have it, David? Yeah, I have one more thing. Um, guys, uh, a lot of you have been reaching out to me on Ethno, actually, telling me that you enjoy the podcast and stuff. Um, Awesome. I love that. Uh, if you do listen to it and you haven't reached out to me, do let me know. Um, but also if you guys could follow and like the podcast Instagram and also hit us up on there, that really helps us out. Cause then we know, you know, how many, <clears throat> sorry, then we know how many people are, you know, listening to us and like what they like and it just really helps. So don't, don't be shy. Like hit me up. Yeah. Hit us up on the Instagram, email us. Um, yeah, and if you have ideas for future segments or guests, please email us. Like we have a running list of people that we should interview. Like, uh, so please, um, please do that. Um, yeah, and, David, and rate, rate the podcast and provide us with feedback on uh, whichever podcasting platform you're using uh, to listen to our show. So, on that note, we are out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at A Life in Ruins Podcast. And you can also email us at A Life in Ruins Podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. So, gents, uh, why did the invisible man turn down a job offer? Um, I don't know, Connor. He couldn't see himself doing it. God damn it. <laughs> I'm out. Yep. Thank you.
This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.